Milwaukee police found body parts in a north side apartment and now they wonder if they've uncovered some kind of death factory. Jeffrey Dahmer's murderous orgy is over. You almost destroyed me, but I refuse to let you destroy me. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. Police removed boxes and boxes of body parts, evidence of what appears to be a psychopathic mass murder. Like, you can't tell me that there's nothing here. Hey guys, Chris Starr here and welcome back to my channel. So today's video will be a little different from what I typically do. Usually my videos are very paranormal based, very spooky based, but in today's video I will be focusing on the life of Jeffrey Dahmer and what he did to his victims. But before we get into the video, trigger warning, this content may be sensitive for some. In this video I follow in Jeffrey Dahmer's footsteps throughout the city of Milwaukee. By now many of you are probably familiar with Jeffrey Dahmer, especially after the Netflix series. Jeffrey Dahmer also also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, was a serial killer who murdered 17 boys from the years 1978 to 1991. In this video, I will be visiting multiple locations that Jeffrey Dahmer would frequent, as well as the site of the Oxford apartments where Jeffrey Dahmer lived and murdered 11 of his victims. But I have to say, the energy in Milwaukee was intense and emotional. I will heavily be focusing on the Ambassador Hotel, where my girl Brooke and I will be spending two nights. We did attempt to get room 507, which is the same exact room that Jeffrey murdered his second victim, Stephen Tuami. Now, I do apologize if I'm saying Stephen's name incorrectly. You guys know that I sometimes struggle to say words. I have heard people say Tuami, and I also have heard people say Tumi. But before we get into the video, I have something super fun to announce. On a lighter note, I have joined the Swagit app, which is a short form video app where I will be posting exclusive content for you guys. And the best part about this, if you guys download the Swagit app and come over and follow me at It's Chris Star. you are entered into an $100 crystal bundle from my crystal shop, The Crystalline Soul. To join, all you have to do is follow the link that is pinned down below in the comments, download the Swagit app, and follow me, It's Chris Star. Follow me and comment on one of my videos and I will be picking a winner in 30 days. Swagit is a fun and family-friendly short-form video app where you can actually earn money while using it. You get points for simply joining and you can gift those points to your favorite creators and get double the points for doing so. You can exchange those points for gift cards or even PayPal cash. So come and join me for exclusive content and your chance to win a hundred dollar crystal bundle from my crystal shop, The Crystalline Soul. I am really excited for this because I've been wanting to do behind the scenes of my crystal shop and my restocks and possibly packing some of your guys' orders. So come join me on Swagit, follow It's Chris Star, and hopefully I will see you there. All right guys, so we are standing outside of our hotel room, room 506. Right across the way is room 507. This is the exact room where Jeffrey Dahmer brought his victim, Stephen Tuami, back, drug him, and according to Dahmer, accidentally murdered him. We were unable to get this room. There's a lot of mystery behind why we were unable to get this room. Brooke actually booked this room a couple months ago, and when I was checking in, I was told by one of the workers that we can absolutely not stay in here because the room is under maintenance conveniently. So room 506 would be near identical to room 507. And honestly, guys, if there is still energy lingering here, I do believe it will come through to us in our room as well. So I'm gonna give you guys a little peek into our room before we go out into Milwaukee and follow in Jeffrey Dahmer's footsteps. <laughs> According to the hotel staff, this entire hotel was gutted and redone back in the 90s, but honestly, it kind of really looks the same to me. So let's take a peek. Honestly, guys, let me know what you think, but I truly think that they are trying to erase Jeffrey Dahmer from the Ambassador Hotel. The way that they acted about us staying here um, was just 
a little strange to me. I did tell her that we come here with nothing but respect for the victims and their families. And obviously we are just here to follow in Jeffrey Dahmer's footsteps and really just to keep sharing the story about what happened to the victims and just, just bring light. And hopefully if we are able to connect with anyone along the way, uh, any one of his victims, if we are able to connect with them, we would love to help them in any way we can. Spiritually, you guys know what I do. I love to help spirits cross over. So if there is anything that I can do along the way, I absolutely will be doing that. I also want to point out that the original lady that I spoke to when I checked into the hotel, she, uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I don't know what to believe about this considering what the other workers said, but she said that there is no relevance or significance to Jeffrey Dahmer and the Ambassador Hotel. So let me know what you guys think. Jeffrey Dahmer was very adamant that he met Stephen Tuami just across the street at one of the gay bars and he brought him back here. It was never his intention to murder Stephen Tuami. So he brought him back here with the intention to have fun, right? I guess just use your imagination, right? Uh, I'm sure if you guys are watching this, you know quite a bit about Jeffrey Dahmer at this point. You probably have watched the Netflix series. He gave him basically a roofie and he fell asleep and Jeffrey Dahmer completely blacked out and this is the only murder that he does not remember. Jeffrey Dahmer said that when he woke up, Stephen Tuami was hanging off the bed with bruises on his body and his chest caved in. What do you think? Like, what do you feel about this? Do you feel like he was actually here at this hotel? I do. I feel like the energy definitely is, is heavy. And when I was in here yesterday before Brooke got here, I think it all hit me out once. I had this moment of realization that Jeffrey Dahmer did in fact walk through these doors with really bad intentions. And I just could not believe that I was sitting here in a hotel room directly across the way from where he murdered his second victim. Not to mention guys, Jeffrey Dahmer's apartments, the Oxford apartments are two minutes away and we will be going there in just a few. But I did want to point out as well that Jeffrey brought Stephen Tuami's body back to his grandmother's house, which we will also be visiting. He put Stephen's body in a suitcase, brought the body back to his grandmother's house where it sat for about a week before he dismembered the body and he took the flesh and the muscle off the body, bagged it up in garbage bags and put it outside of his grandmother's house for the garbage men to come and pick up. He kept Steven's skull for his own weird sexual fantasies, which is so heinous and just downright weird, honestly. Something I found out this morning is that it would have been 30 years on November 20th of Steven Tuami's death. It is September 22nd. So I feel like the energy is probably going to be more intense during this time. I really hope that we're able to communicate with Steven. Honestly, guys, the hope is that Steven Tuami's spirit is not still trapped here, but if we are able to communicate with him, I would love to see if there's anything I can do, get his voice out there, see if there's anything more that he would like to share with the world, and maybe even hopefully cross him over. This is the only case where the remains were never found, and I feel like because of that, it adds this entire other element of unrest, and pff, honestly, guys, if that was you, and you were murdered, and they never found your remains and you never had a proper burial or you were put to rest in proper way, how would you feel? Yeah, because of what he did, how he dismembered the body and how he boiled the flesh off of the body, boiled the skull, pulverized the skull and then scattered it everywhere, there's absolutely no way that they were able to find his remains. All right guys, so I have Cameron behind me. He also does YouTube. He came here to film, um, I guess something about Je Jeffrey Dahmer for his channel. He was turned away from room 507 as well. He saw my camera and he ran out here to ask if we were also turned away from room 507. So what did they tell you? Well, first I showed up uh, on Saturday and I was told by two different people that it was an issue with just maintenance and it could be it could be taken care of by the end of the week. So now it is Tuesday following last Saturday and now I'm told that the entire floor is being shampooed. So she definitely didn't want me staying anywhere on floor five. I've talked to her on the phone before. I'm not gonna say names because everybody's kind of the same here. Also, I found it interesting that everybody I talked to says that there's no significance to the room 507. 
we were told that as well. Um, everything I've read, the people who have actually gotten into the room by chance has said that they've experienced very bad nightmares. One user wrote that her boyfriend, who did not know anything about the Jeffrey Dahmer murders, um, ended up halfway off the bed oh in God, the middle of the night. Like Stephen. Like Stephen Tuomi was found the next morning after Jeffrey had beaten him to death. Those two sound a little more than a coincidence, so I do feel that there probably is some negative energy in that room. When something terrible like that happens, it throws off psychic energy into the air, right. and that can leave kind of like a scar mm -hmm. on that particular area. I call it like an energy footprint. It is an energy footprint, exactly. There is significance to 507. Um, I don't believe anything they're telling me. I've been trying to get in for three or four days in a row, and I, I booked about a month ago for 507. So they're, they're turning me away. Um, they know I was filming. So all I can say is, is that um, when they tell you that there's no problem, there's definitely a problem. We just pulled up to the site of the old Oxford Apartments and I'm not gonna lie guys, I instantly feel nauseated. The energy here is so uncomfortable, just it's directly right in front of me. I'm like stunned. I can't even believe that I'm here right now. Holy shit. Yeah, my heart just feels like so what's a little disturbing is how much the town advocated for a memorial site here and they did absolutely nothing with it and they had many opportunities to build something here and all they did was leave it as a vacant lot and put a black fence along the perimeter. There's like so many people here right now. I want to get some drone shots but I also don't want to disturb anyone that yeah. lives here so I don't really know what to do right now it's very busy and I don't want to upset anyone but Cameron also said everyone's very welcoming over here right that's what so we are standing on the site of Jeffrey Dahmer's old apartment it is no longer here for obvious reasons it was demolished in November of 1992 so a lot has happened in November okay Stephen Twomey was murdered on November 20th this was torn down in November of 1992 and I am feeling really really off here so as soon as we pulled up I felt ill like just being in this area is really nauseating. I'm really lightheaded and I'm getting a lot of pains in my head. I don't know if I'm just getting a headache, but sometimes when the energy is really intense, I will start to feel it like in my third eye. So that is what I'm experiencing, I believe, right now. Um, a lot of people tragically lost their lives here. The tenants were really suspicious of Dahmer. Um, they described him as being a very strange man. His apartment stank, obviously, like there was just smells radiating from their vents and they knew that something was up. One of the tenants in particular would contact the police on a regular basis and they didn't really want anything to do with her or this apartment. This wasn't the best area back in the day so I feel like the police tried to avoid it and also there was just a lot that was going on and police were aware of it but they just didn't even want to bother. If the police back then did their job then I would say quite a few of the people that Dahmer killed would probably still be around today. So that in itself is really tragic and something that I feel like I, if I were a tenant living here or one of the family members, just knowing that the police ignored those phone calls, I would be just incredibly angry and upset. And I'm sure that the families all feel the same way because nothing was done to stop Dahmer. How could he get away with killing 11 people in his apartment with all of these people living here? They never built a memorial here. And I feel like the city of Milwaukee just tried to cover up what Dahmer did. And in a way, you are shunning the victims. They could have built a memorial, but they chose not to. And instead, there is just this black fence all around the perimeter of where the Oxford Apartments used to sit. Okay, I'm not like understanding why, but I legitimately feel like I'm going to throw up right now. I'm like getting really nervous because I feel like I'm going to throw up. Yeah. Do you want... Do you want me to drive out or do you need a second? I don't know why I feel like this. Well, I know why I feel like this. Yeah, the energy yeah, yeah. is really intense and it's like 
so totally sickening what he did and I think I'm, my body is also just in shock at the yeah. fact that like we're still here or we're here like Brooke I literally feel, I feel like I'm gonna start crying I know I don't know if I'm like working myself up and I'm like just really nauseous but like what the f like this is so f like I cannot believe that I'm here right, right now right? I think we're gonna have to leave because yeah. it, I, I don't want to be here. If you were here, you would absolutely feel the heaviness and the darkness that still lingers because of what he did. And I am just feeling so many different emotions. I think from not just the victims, but the families, the living family members, um, just everything that the, Milwaukee, the city, the neighbors, the tenants all had to endure because of what he did. But I think I'm just like, I'm working myself up and that's why I'm feeling nauseous, but I also have a really bad headache. So I'm, yeah. I'm gonna have to catch up with you guys later. I am unwell. Like I am unwell guys. It's very hard for me to be there because I'm very sensitive to energy as it is. And I felt like I was feeling all of the emotions from the victims and their families and the neighborhood and basically what the entire city of Milwaukee had to endure from Dahmer and I have a really bad headache. I am hoping that as we drive away from that location that I start to feel better because this hit me out of nowhere. Like it hit me like a ton of bricks. I am very unwell right now. <laughs> Hold on. Oh my God. Yes. Is there someone here with us? You just made that go off. Can you make that go off for us again? There we go. We just got back to our hotel room. I took the REM pod out and the temperature is changing. There is something here that is fluctuating with the temperature. Wow. <gasps> oh my God. Yes. Can you step away from that? Oh my God. Literally every time I say, can you step away from that before I started filming? Yeah, the last right? time you did it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just start. We we just ordered some Taco Bell, and we're gonna get our night started here. Do a little investigation here in room 506. Probably go outside to room 507 as well. But yeah, shit's already going down, guys. So I don't even know. This might not even be. This was this was not his room. I get it. Okay, trust and believe. I get it. There is something here interfering with that because as you can see, you have to physically get near it in order for that to go off. After a crazy ass night, I am feeling like there is something that will come through, especially after my experience at his old apartment. We have a lot of equipment. So I have my Hexcom, which is basically a word bank. Um, we have the REM pod, of course, one of my favorite pieces. And then we have an EMF meter and I will be using the Spirit Box app on my phone as I do in every investigation. I feel like if I was picking up on the energy so intensely at Jeffrey Dahmer's old apartment, then what was that? <laughs> my tummy. <laughs> oh my God. I'm like, I'm freaked out. I'm Sorry. like, there are noises everywhere. <laughs> like what is going on? If I can so intensely pick up on the energy at Jeffrey Dahmer's old apartment, then I can absolutely do that here. So tonight I want to see what I can actually tap into what I'm getting intuitively. I do feel like 506 is definitely there's definitely a lot going on here, okay? We're not in 507. I don't think the energy is binded to that room. I don't know, like the energy was just so heavy. It was unlike anything I've ever felt. Actually, I, we were supposed to go back tonight, guys, and I decided against it because I was so ill, like so unwell, I thought I was gonna throw up. Like I couldn't even speak because I was about to start gagging. Like, how did you feel? I did not feel good. <clears throat> I felt very lightheaded. I just felt like I had no words. Yeah, so I think it's probably, like, I wanted to go back there tonight, but there's so much to investigate here, and there's so much energy here. And after my experience there, I honestly, I don't want to feel that again. I'm gonna be real. Yeah. I'm going to be real with you guys. I don't want to feel that again. So you guys got the picture. I brought you guys to Dahmer's old apartment. I showed you guys around, and I hope that that suffices because I do not want to feel that energy again. I felt so wrong being there. And I can't even tell you the last time I felt so physically ill being at a location. He heard that? Yeah. It sounded like somebody was knocking on the door. It almost sounded like somebody like pushed on the door. Nobody is on this floor. So something I forgot to mention, we are the only people that 
they allowed on this floor we spoke to cameron earlier and he said they told him this entire floor was under maintenance we have not seen anybody we have not heard anybody with the exception of last night when people came up here and were pounding on 507 saying F you Dahmer um, they were so loud and obnoxious I almost got up and opened the door I was gonna scare the shit out of them because they were probably also told that nobody was allowed up here so that's probably why they were making that much noise it was like 3 a.m. they were making so much noise because they're probably like well nobody's up here so why does it matter if I'm loud they were like kicking the freaking door in but we are about to go lights out so let's do it it seems like there is someone trying to communicate with us already it looks like the temperature is shifting you see that's the temperature going i'm gonna what the hell okay the temperature near it is fluctuating i'm gonna turn the hexacom back on so i'm gonna take a moment just just to um ground my energy and see if there's any any energy here that i can um tap into we're calling out to steven tuami steven tuami we know what happened to you in room 507 can you come here and talk with us tonight we really would like to get your voice out we would like to help share your story we feel like this hotel is trying to erase what happened and I don't like that I want you to feel heard we have a couple devices here you can um, get close to any one of them and communicate is it not working Neat. Neat. <laughs> so the EMF meter is dead why would it be dead, be dead? Can you back away from that? Can you step away? Thank you. So when when I ask you to step away and the device stops, that's kind of how I know that you're here with me. Thank you so much for coming through tonight, whoever I'm speaking to. We have a couple ways for you to communicate with us. This device here has words. You can choose a word to populate on this device for us and give us a response to our question or you can get near that device. So I am going to break out the Spirit Box app that I use. I do have links down below in the description, guys. If you are interested in using this app, please use responsibly. This is very, very accurate. Throat. I was about to ask if somebody's here with me right now. It's like it read my mind. Can you, can you step away? I'm going to turn this device on here. Can you come through this as well? We're calling out to Steven Tuami. Steven. Steven, can you tell me yes or no? Are you here? Here. That said here. Mm -hmm. Do you feel trapped here because of what happened to you? Yes. Is there anything that we can do for you? For me. For me. For me. Hi, mom. For me. Hi, mom. Trapped. I heard trapped. Trapped. Do you like when people come here and talk to you? Wow. Confused. Yeah. He's probably confused. Maybe there's too much going on. Did you have any? Concern about Jeffrey? Did that say Jeff? Uh -huh. What did he do to you? How do you feel that Jeffrey Dahmer was killed in jail? Does that bring you any sort of peace? Do you know what he did to his other victims? Can you only see what's here right now? I feel like because he's trapped, he's unable to kind of see like past, present, and future. Like when spirits cross on. Yeah, and like, maybe that's why he's so confused. Yeah, like. Um, also, I think your battery is dying. 
my battery out my Right? Wait, what? Okay, you said I'm Okay. This REM pod will not stop going off since we turned it on. There is definitely someone here with us, whether it's Steven or somebody else at this hotel. This hotel dates back to pre-prohibition. Mm -hmm. There was a lot that went on here. A lot of energy has come through this hotel. I just heard a bang. Me too. Is there anything you can do for us? Can you knock? Can you make a noise or a sound to let us know that you're you're here, that you that you're really here with us? The temperature thing is, is like trying to change. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can you step away from that for now? Can you step away? Thank you. It says called and then it says follow. Called and followed. Steven, oh my gosh. As I, I say his name. Like you can't tell me that there's nothing here. One of the workers was like, people come all the time and they think they're communicating to Steven or Jeffrey Dahmer. And she's like, I don't think so. They have to be communicating to someone else. And I'm like, you don't know that though. Like, you just don't know. We don't, we never truly know, but intuitively I absolutely can feel Steven's presence. He had such a traumatic death and there's absolutely no rest for him, right? Like they could not find his body. Like imagine you were murdered and your body was scattered and you couldn't have a proper burial. Your family cannot lay you to rest and, and say like a proper goodbye. That would be very confusing for me. And I feel like he's stuck in this like loop of energy. Tight. Did you hear that yeah, big bang? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Steven, can you come through on this device in my hand? Steven. <coughs> yes. Here. Steven, can you say your name for us? say Steven? It did. It's me. I heard it's me. Steven, where are you right now? So I grab my dowsing rods. I am going to use them to see if I can figure out where the energy in this room might be. I'm going to put the spirit box on at the same time again. <laughs> Sounds like something was just shuffling in the bathroom. Like there was just movement in the hallway. Did you hear that? Or? I didn't hear that. I was like scratching my eyes, so I was, wasn't paying attention to anything. Oh my god, this is so loud. I might have to turn this off. Me. Wow, you just said there was shuffling in the hallway. Yeah. Me. Steven, can you cross for yes and open for no? Can you see us right now? Steven, are you angry with what happened to you? Mother, mom. Do you think there's anything we can do to help you? Steven, can you point to where you are standing in the room right now? Are they moving? It's pointing to the right, and you know what it says on the hex bomb? Heaven. Oh my god. Stephen, are you ready to move on? Oh my god. I hope you know how truly sorry I am for what you went through. Oh my god. Okay, like... Remember I told you my ribs were really hurting? They literally feel bruised. Like, if I touch my ribs, it hurts to touch my ribs. And I didn't know this, but Steven's ribs, a couple of his ribs were broken. Brooke told me this morning. And the feeling subsided throughout the day, but it's back. Like, if I touch my rib, it feels bruised. That says pretty. There is like multiple tabs.
cops I right know. now. Over here. How is the temperature changing so drastically right now? That's what I mean. Like, there's some sort of disturbance. What? I don't know. I'm just really sad. Like, I'm almost starting to feel like how I felt before at the apartment. Is there anything we can do at all? We want nothing more than for you to find peace. So you can move on to what, you're, what, what you will do next. You will go on. This is, this is not it. There's so much more to this. There's so much more to our existence. And you have the ability to go on and, and live a whole other lifetime wherever you choose. Whenever you choose, it's up to you. But I need you to realize that. Yes, like, it's not comfortable for him. He doesn't like it, but he's so confused. I don't even know if he, like, realizes like, what happened in its entirety. I absolutely feel someone there. Me too. Do you feel someone there in the hallway? Mm -hmm. I am. Do you want to go out there? Yeah. I think we should go out there. Oh my god, this is so loud. Trapped. Trapped. My whole left arm is tingling like it's numb. Get him. That's a Get him. Steven, so we were called out here and I feel like that was you. Are you out here with us now? What? Is there anything you would like to say to us now that we're out here? Can you make this device go off for us again? You were making it go off a lot before. I can't even describe it. Like the minute that I came and sat by this door, I am so drained. I can get in the bed right now and go to sleep. There is just someone walking back there waiting for on. Are you sure no one's up here with us? You don't think so? That's an ice yes. room? Yeah. It's just ice. There was just it. a man talking. You didn't hear that? It wasn't coming from the spirit box. No. That was so loud, there is no way the camera did not pick that up. What did you hear? It was just a man talking, I don't know, because I heard this I going. Just, I was just but this was going. And I've been just so focused because I'm so cold up here. I have goosebumps. I'm so freezing. I just find it really bizarre that we are in front of room 507 and the rem pod is not going off. We like do not look good right now, wait. So, Brooke well, is, Brooke is am filming for freezing. me. Brooke's filming for me and I just looked at her and she was like staring out to me. Yeah, nowhere. I'm not gonna lie, I did just kind of completely focus like off of you. And I'm really cold. And I just, it was like a shift from there. Over. I heard There's no one up here. Brooke was just like listening into the two rooms down there just to see if like there's any noise coming from them and there's not. This is going off. This is going off. Something in the ice room. I heard a man and then so the sounds back I there. Had, I didn't hear the man, but I heard the sounds. We are about to get some sleep. We have to wake up really early tomorrow. We have a couple more locations on this journey. So I guess we'll see you guys in the morning. Hopefully we get some sleep. Hopefully I don't wake up and feel like my ribs are bruised. I'm not drained when I wake up because today really kicked my ass. Like <laughs> I have not felt right since we went to his old apartment. <laughs> Oh my boss guys, so we are in room 507. This was Jeffrey Dahmer's room. This was the room's house. 
I just put my hex cam on. We have like literally two minutes in here, but I wanted to show you guys around. I can't even believe how many. So I don't know how long we have. We only have a few minutes, but I didn't want to bring anything too loud. So I brought the hex cam. But this is really all right guys so that is a wrap here at the ambassador hotel we had quite the night and i cannot believe we were just able to get inside of room 507 jeffrey dahmer's room we just saw jeffrey dahmer no like lit like literally a man just walked into the elevator and he looked just like jeffrey dahmer tall lanky the glasses the hair it the was face like i swear he he's like trying to look like him i'm like i'm stunned i'm in shock I'm in shock. We just saw Jeffrey Dahmer. Can you imagine? We're like literally seeing a ghost. Oh my god. <laughs> Are we gonna go like try to find this man? Are we gonna go try to find this man right now? We're going. We're going on a hunt for Jeffrey Dahmer. No, like seriously, guys. He we just fucking jumped up. He was literally right there. Jeffrey, whole fucking, his whole even, being was right speak. there. I was so stunned when he walked in. We are heading out of the Ambassador. On to the next location. We are just heading to the neighborhood where Jeffrey Dahmer used to live with his grandmother. But this is also going to be another heavy location, guys. We are pulling up to Jeffrey Dahmer's grandmother's house. Oh my god, it's literally right here. Yeah. Oh my god. So his grandmother's house is right behind us. This is a very normal residential neighborhood. Jeffrey confessed of 17 murders, three of which were at his grandmother's house. And let's not forget about the one that got away. Oh my god, so same shutters. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks original. It looks just like how it looked in the Netflix series. They did a pretty good job with that. But I just think coming here, we visited a lot of the locations that Jeffrey Dahmer frequented. Um, and murdered his victims but but I would say there's just something a little different about his grandmother's house the fact that his grandmother had dementia she was unwell and he was taking advantage of her like this sweet innocent old lady right like his grandmother I could never imagine doing that to my grandmother let alone any grandmother and when he was arrested she was so distraught it's just not the victims like you have to think about sometimes like what I think about too when I see serial killers and just people who kill people in general I think about their families because his grandmother truly was innocent right like she was not involved she had no idea she had nothing but the best intentions it was her love was so pure for him so you can't help but to also feel for his family as well now his dad is a different story that's a little touchy for me because i feel like his dad had some sociopathic tendencies and his mother was completely unemotionally available um but i do have a lot of empathy for his grandma and i just think grandmas are really special and it just really sucks um that she was way into her dementia at this point and when he got arrested she was just so totally distraught yeah oh my gosh and look at the glasses what is that? <gasps> what? <laughs> what is that? what he looked like jeffrey dahmer <laughs> like a little driving like a 1990s older. volkswagen uh, with the glasses was this not a volkswagen what's it called station um, wagon mm -hmm. Oof. Now this location hits a little different because of what he put his grandmother through. She was well into her dementia when he was arrested and watching the Netflix series during that scene was just really heartbreaking to me. Jeffrey confessed of 17 murders, three of which were here at his grandmother's house. His grandmother, like if she had not called his dad and told him about the stench that was radiating from the basement, I don't think they would have ever discovered anything that he was doing there i know that she before everything started going on so i do know before she got ill she was suspicious of jeffrey and she knew that he was up to something i don't know if she knew exactly what maybe in her heart she felt like he was doing something heinous and something very very wrong but if it wasn't for her i don't know if they would have found out about what he was doing in that basement but it is absolutely heartbreaking to see what his grandmother went through during the arrest obviously my thoughts are with the victims as well Stephen tuami whose bones and, and body parts were thrown away in garbage bags and scattered throughout the property obviously my thoughts are with the victims and Stephen tuami whose 
body parts and skull were thrown away in garbage bags and scattered throughout the property. It's just an overall really bad um, energy that still is lingering. And I do wonder if there's any spiritual activity that goes on in that house because I would imagine that it's probably been a bit challenging for their spirits to move on. So I was just reading an article that dates back to his arrest, the year that he was arrested. And two out of the three bodies that they found in the grandmother's house, they could not identify. So I do have to look into that because I, I feel like there are some victims that were never identified. And I also feel like Jeffrey probably has killed more people and has just forgotten about it. He confessed to 17. I don't think he has a problem confessing to the murders, but considering he blacked out when he murdered Stephen Tuami and he was just so mentally unwell, I don't know. It's something is just telling me that he probably murdered more people. So with that unrest and the fact that some of them were never identified and, and didn't even really have families while they were alive, I just feel like this was so traumatic and what comes along with a traumatic death usually that purgatory usually these spirits are stuck in that loop of energy and it's absolutely heartbreaking i would love to think that that's not the case but something is telling me that there is still some lingering energy from what jeffrey did and his victims in his grandmother's house so guys we are at our last stop here on our journey of following jeffrey dahmer in his footsteps through milwaukee and i am at probably my favorite location i think i've ever been i will be coming back here and covering much more of this cigar bar that jeffrey dahmer used to frequent but i'm about to introduce you guys to bob who is now the current owner who used to serve jeffrey dahmer his gin and tonics which i think is a little ironic because you guys know that i love my gin and tonic without further ado let me introduce you to bob bob you are the current owner of shakers I am indeed. And how long have you been here for? 36 years. Wow, so you used to serve Jeffrey Dahmer his drinks. <laughs> yes. And we will be getting into that shortly, guys. So we're gonna be sitting down and I have a lot of juicy questions for you. So I hope that's okay. Absolutely. Cool. Let's do it. Bob knows a lot about Milwaukee in general and a lot about the Jeffrey Dahmer case. And um, we have some interesting artifacts from Jeffrey Dahmer, right? We do indeed. So let's uh, go take a peek at this So one. this great photo op right over here. This stool, bar stool, used to be at the front bar. And we had a complete series of these both at the front and the back bar. Exact same style. But this one, for whatever reason, when they manufactured it, has this little spacer. So it's about so much higher than the others. You probably don't even notice this. But for whatever reason, Dahmer did, he'd walk in, he'd come right to this bar stool at the front bar. If somebody else was in it, he would wait on the side and just glare at people until somebody left and he'd sit here. There's never a conversation with him, but this is the stool that he liked. Wow, and you keep it right here. We do. I can't even believe it. We were here last night, guys, and Brooke and I walked right past it. I'm, I'm fascinated with the fact that this is still here. So gin and tonic, of course, gin makes you sin. And that's my one of my favorite drinks. Of I course it is, of course. And uh, oddly enough, most serial killers drink gin and tonic. Hmm. Heard about that one. Mm -hmm. I'm not a serial killer. No. Not at but, all. But again, everyone says that, right? Everyone does say that, so mm -hmm. you gotta watch out for that. Just sure. saying. So I was the person next door, and that's one of the reasons that we do these tours is because there are significant lessons to be learned. And one of those lessons is you don't accept drinks from strangers, you don't leave your drink at the bar, you don't go home to have someone take pictures for OnlyFans and now or something else, right? Right. But it's, you know, people are just um, not aware of what takes place. And it really is that guy next door. It could be your, your uncle as well, who's the pedophile, that you don't really, he's kind of creepy, you're not sure what's going on with him. And then years later, you hear stories about really untoward things taking place. You just never know. People have this little thing about them, this little proclivity, this little bent, that they are less than desirable in so many ways. And mm -hmm. I think that just, you know, the cover of darkness brings out so much upon everybody. Right. Do you think that there could have been anything spiritual going on with Jeffrey Dahmer? So that there's speculation that he could have possibly been possessed, right? He could have had some sort of like demonic attachment. And I'm curious about your thoughts on that, because that's a whole other... Well, I, I think that Dahmer was beyond just a sociopath, maybe not quite the criteria for a psychopath. As far as something else taking place, he certainly has evidence that he had a desire for The Exorcist, I think, especially number, number two and number three, I think, were his big shows. Um, he had built his own little altar as well, and that bodes for something other than the norm. Um, as far as possession goes, 
I don't know about that, but he certainly had other things taking place in his mind that were beyond the norm. Right. And if you want to suggest to me that there was some other spiritual influence, why not? It's a possibility. Why not? Right. So you believe in spirits, right? You believe in the spiritual side of life. In my, mind, in my mind, essence precedes existence, and therefore, in my mind, essence succeeds existence. So when you are finished with this shell that you have, right. the energy that's you continues on. I 100% agree with that. There that is go. the best way to put it. That is how I've believed it my entire life. So Cheers to that. Yeah. Now, as far as uh, you know, Dahmer again, he uh, was motivated by a variety of different things. And I think that there's consensus that really what he wanted most was to have acceptance with someone. And because of his other oddities, you know, that wasn't necessarily going to work for him. So he had to find a way to maintain a relationship. And whether that person was alive or not, maybe didn't matter to him so much. He wanted that intimacy with that body. He wanted that contact. Right. And he couldn't get that when they were alive because people thought he was weird. It made them uncomfortable, clearly. Well, he was. So when he came in here, we talked about this. He came in here for cocktails. Shakers is very busy. There's 30 odd people on staff and they're almost all female. And um, Dahmer would not allow the female bartenders or servers to get his cocktail. He would get somebody to come out of the kitchen. More often than not, it's me. I'm a chef as well. And make him his gin and tonic. There wasn't great conversation taking place. You know, I'm, you'll read about me one day. I'm a serial killer. Just this odd guy with these eyes that would bore into you. And I will never forget those eyes. So I often um, speak about like Jurassic Park, where you, you see the T-Rex the first time, or you see Jaws, you see the, the shark. And they've got this very menacing yet dead looking eye that just bores into you. And that's what Dahmer had when he came here. I couldn't even imagine sitting face to face with him. Do you remember those moments? Are they like stuck in your in I your never head? sat with him. Uh, all I did was I, I pulled out of the kitchen to make a gin and tonic for this guy. Right. But you see him walk in the place. And um, lunch here was always corporate America. So it was judges and attorneys and you know whatever else it was. And um, he certainly didn't fit in. He just, he dressed differently. He comported himself differently. He was just that odd guy. You walked in, here's that odd guy again. Here's that odd guy again. So he didn't speak to anyone? No, 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 no. So that particular stool that's right there used to be at the front bar. And the front and the back bar both had the exact same stool. There's 24 of those things. But that one, for whatever reason they made it, is just a little bit taller. So when we changed the sets on the stools, we maintained that one. He would gravitate towards that one. My personal theory is that he wanted to be in a stool that was just a little bit higher than everybody else. And if he'd walk in and that's taken at the front bar, he would just kind of stand off the side and wait till that's empty so he could sit in that one. Interesting. Kind of like- One way to put it, odd. Psychology would be like he's up higher so he kind of has more power or sure. more control over his environment. I don't know. It's, it's a very fascinating uh, little aspect of his visit here, I feel like. One of the reasons I think he even came here was because, of course, this was his hunt zone. So the gay bars were on either side of us, and we were that little you know, oasis in the center. But um, not just the judges and prosecutors and attorneys, all the people that were here were people that could put him away forever. And I think that, you know, that wasn't a secret at all, what my clientele was, or the federal agents or the cops that come here. So I think that he wanted to be in a place where he could be the, the baddest guy in the room. Nobody knows who he is. And I think he kind of reveled in that. Yeah. That's my personal thought. So. Like, haha, you can't catch me. Right. You don't know what I'm doing. And he was Teflon because time and again, the system had him, right? So whether that was uh, the different judges, different prosecutors, even the social workers that had control of him, uh, his parole officer, they all just gave him a huge pass. They did. And so how do you think that made the city of Milwaukee feel when he was finally caught knowing his, his track record and that there were so many chances for him to actually be caught? Do you think that upset people? Well, it had to. I mean, clearly we were caught with our pants down and you know all the flaws are just right there in the open. And um, as far as the coppers go, that I, I know the cops personally that uh, turned uh, Conorak back to him. We can say they're incompetent. Let's do okay. that. So I don't think it was, it was racially motivated. I don't think it was sexually motivated. I think they were just incompetent. Um, they had other things to take care of that day, and this is a nuisance to them. Right. That you know, people are, are literally getting beaten up, people are getting robbed, domestic violence, something else is taking place, and we got to take care of this. Okay. And he manipulated so. people too. Like he was really good at speaking when he finally mm -hmm. did speak. Mm -hmm. 
So. Yeah, he was not. He was not dumb. I mean, obviously, he went to school at Ohio State. He's he's a bright guy. Yeah. Right. He could have done much more. And even when he was in the army, the reason he was a medical corpsman was because he was smarter than the average schmuck that is, you know, stuck in the army. And uh, he really could have gone on to do other things, but he had this really dark side about him as well. Right. So when was the last time you saw him before he was actually arrested? Did he frequent this bar up until his arrest? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we saw much more of him. Uh, we, you know, he might have been here before 1991, but we started noticing this guy, particularly in January of 1991. And as the year went on, the frequency increased as well, just like his kill rate, by the way. So here we are. Uh, you know, he's here much more frequently in 1991. And it was probably the week before he was captured that he was in the house. That night, there's a flurry of activity. Cops are coming and going everywhere because we're a cop bar. And the next morning, it's 7 o'clock in the morning or so, and I get a phone call from one of the federal agents that I have known for years and said, would you mind opening early? I don't mind at all. So I'm thinking, you know, we, we open up at noon. I can be there at 11 o'clock. He's like, how about now? Mm. Sure. So I, I literally drove down, uh, bleary-eyed, and I'm standing behind the bar. And they've got 10 or 12 people here. And um, it was the... Uh, district attorney's office and uh, whatever federal prosecutor was here, uh, U.S. attorney's office, the agents obviously, several detectives were here, and then they had a couple, only two Milwaukee media people. So they wanted the story to go to the local people before everybody in the world converged on Milwaukee. And uh, as they're handing out the, the mug sheet, you know, here it is, here's his booking uh, paraphernalia, I'm behind the bar and I'm like, time out right there, I recognize this guy and here's my story about this. So before that point, I had no idea whatsoever. Um, I hadn't yet seen the morning papers about what had taken place the night before, so this was my eye-opener. Were you shocked when you saw it was him? Well, yes and no. I mean, um, it's not every day that you uh, have you had the experience to serve a serial killer or a murderer. Uh, but, you know, he was so odd that I guess maybe I wasn't that surprised. I knew something was up with him, yeah. just not the magnitude. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd be too shocked. Just. Uh, you could probably pick up on people's energy, right? Like you kind of get a vibe for them when you're with them. And I feel like just serving him his drinks and how he would act, his mannerisms and stuff like that, I feel like I would think something was kind of wrong. So when I would see that, I, I just feel like in that moment, I'd be like not super shocked, you know, but still probably very shocking to the city of Milwaukee of serial killer. And I'm sure everybody was like, pretty on guard after. Absolutely, so it, it destroyed a lot of careers. There's a lot of collateral damage that went along with this. And I'm not just talking about the cops. They obviously, they deserve not to be in that capacity anymore. And um, what's odd about that is that they were suspended, then reinstated, and then they went on to other careers with other law enforcement agencies. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and one, in fact, still is the assistant chief at something just a bit north of us. So, um, they did okay, but the city itself did very poorly. Any of the real estate around that area suffered tremendously. Everything down here suffered tremendously as well because this is where you would hunt for people. Um, those gay clubs are no longer in business with the exception of one. Which one is, is still That's open? the dance club that's on uh, 2nd and National Avenue. What's it called? Lacage. Okay. I didn't even know about that one. Yeah, so Lacage is still there. And it's a very popular dance club, so you don't have to be gay to be there. It's a dance club, right? Okay. Um, so next time you're in town, I can hook you up with Dave who now owns that yeah, and you can tour that. Absolutely. Cool. So, but everything else is gone. And there had to be at that time another 20 odd gay clubs. And that of course also impacted the lesbian clubs and everything that was outside the normal purview, the city helped them to not be in business anymore. So did he actually hunt anybody here at Shakers? Um, not to my knowledge and we wouldn't have the clientele that he was most interested in. Okay, so you just think he kind of came here because it was almost like a power trip for him? That's a big part of it. And we literally are halfway through his hunt zone. So you think about, you know, January, it's cold outside. And this I think is one of the attractions for him to pick people up because, you know, you got a kid that says to their parents, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gay. And they're like, get out of the house. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want you here anymore. So here's this poor kid, 16, 17, whatever he is and he needs shelter, he needs something, so he comes down where the gay clubs are, and in some he can't get in, the others were very lax about that, and some he can't get in, but here's this friendly guy who is not unattractive, right? Weird. Yeah. But could make it a point to be friendly when he wanted to be. Right. 
let me get you some cocktails. We'll get you some booze. I got this. We'll get you some food. Yeah. Hey, come to my place. We'll take some pictures together. We'll hang right. out. It's all good. Okay. Because your world has just been turned upside down, right? right? Your family doesn't want you. You're debased, right? You don't fit in. And here's their salvation. So I see him as that guy. But at the same point, I see him walking the streets in January going, I got to just step inside for a minute and get warm myself, right? Right. So, and then at the same time, he knows what our clientele is. He knows what goes on here. So it's like a little double header for him. Anyway, it's been a pleasure having you in today. I'm glad you came to Milwaukee. I'm so glad nice. you came to Shakers and look forward to seeing you another oh, I can't time. Wait. Thank We're you. We're going to hang out again. And I'm sure you have more stories for me. I can't wait. <laughs> I didn't actually have time to do like a proper outro, but I wanted to give you guys some of my thoughts. Sitting down with Bob was so insightful and I'm so grateful for that experience. So Bob, if you were watching, thank you so much. It was such an incredible time and I'm just so happy that I got to meet you and hear all of your stories. Shakers is such a beautiful place. There's a lot of history and I can't wait to go back there. That'll be a whole separate video, but thank you guys so much for coming along on this adventure, walking in Jeffrey Dahmer's footsteps. I really hope that I was able to bring some light to this case. And again, this entire video was done with nothing but respect for the victims. I'm truly just trying to um, continue to give the victims a voice because I feel like in a way they were silenced by the city of Milwaukee. Bob did tell me something that I thought was really interesting. The families of the victims, some of the families of the victims actually did not want a memorial. I don't know, I'm just sending my love and my energy out to the victims of Jeffrey Dahmer and I hope that you guys can as well. This is a really touchy case and I hope that, I hope I was able to shed some light and just continue to give the victims a voice. I hope that you guys enjoyed this and I will catch you guys soon. <laughs>